Hi, this is Adam Eliel Berkowitz. I'm here with Dr. Phaedra Shapiro. Um, she is the executive director of the Israel Center for Jewish Christian Relations. She also is um, a senior fellow at the Philos Project, which promotes positive Christian engagement in the Middle East. If I, she's one of these people that if I sat here and said everything she does, um, we'd be here all night. She's a very busy person in a lot of really amazing projects. Um, she wrote an article that really made me sit up and pay notice. Um, it was an op-ed in the Times of Israel. The headline was The Undoing of Jesus. I'll put the uh, the link to it in, um, in, in, the, in the description. Um, she relates to the fact that the, how I think the, the influence of, of a Jewish Jesus has affected the Christian world and the world at large. Um, I, I was kind of very interested in this article because so many times I've been connecting with Christians and they'll come up to me and they'll be like, I just found out Jesus was Jewish. And I'm sitting here saying, what else could he possibly have been? You know, so, so and, and it's so significant to them, and I never understood. So when a person does not think that Jesus was Jewish, what's the, what's the option? What are they saying? Right. So I don't think that it's a question of, you know, not thinking that Jesus was Jewish. Um, or that, you know, they thought that Jesus was something else, and then they suddenly realized, no, that's wrong, he was actually Jewish. I think that, you know, for, for most people, for most Christians, it's simply not something that they think a lot about. They might know, you know, if you ask them, they would say, oh, right, Jesus was Jewish, sure. But when people, when Christians say, oh, they've discovered that Jesus was Jewish, I think what they're really saying is they've just sort of really, um, really become aware of, of how important this is, of the implications of it, that it's not sort of accidental. It's not just a sort of oh, wow. a fact. It's something very deep and very critical uh, for, for their own faith. Oh, for their own faith. That's interesting. Because when I read the New Testament, I mean, it's very clear to me, Jesus was Jewish. He was acting like a Jew in Israel. So um, that's interesting. So you're saying um, the Jewish identity of Jesus does have implications for Christian faith today. Oh, I think ab absolutely. Um, no, no question. I mean, I don't know if you remember, there was a whole sort of um, movement. I don't even know if it still exists, but like uh, among American uh, evangelical Christians of like WWJD, what would Jesus do? And that this was sort of the, you know, how you know what to do is to think about what would Jesus do? And I always think, well, what Jesus would do is he would, you know, follow Torah and mitzvot and God's commandments. And he would read the Hebrew Bible and he would pray uh, the Shema, just like we do, you know, uh, that, you know, as I say in the article that, uh, you know, Jesus uh, probably, almost certainly, had more in common uh, with my 23-year-old son, you know, who observes Torah and goes to synagogue and, you know, keeps Shabbat and celebrates Pesach and lives in the land of Israel, um, then, uh, you know, Jesus has in common with, I don't know, an evangelical living in the Bible Belt. Yeah, I... I've, I've found actually reading the New Testament to be comforting, um, not because it influenced my belief um, or anything, but I was reading about a Jew in the first century in Israel. Um, it, it, there were a lot of commonalities, a lot of things that felt very, very homey, very Jewish. I think absolutely. And uh, I mean, I would also... Um can also cut this out if you don't like it. But I would also say that, you know, Jews don't read the New Testament. We don't read the New Testament for all sorts of reasons. But I think that if we understood um, at the same time as Christians would come to understand more that this is a thoroughly Jewish book and it's full of Jewish uh, 
language and Jewish scripture and Jewish expectation and Jewish practices and, and full of Jews, uh, Jewish arguments, Jewish categories, right? Yeah. Uh, then we might be a little bit less afraid of it. Uh, right. I was stunned, like reading about Jesus jumping into the mikveh, jumping into the ritual bath, you know, and seeing the heavens open up. I used to live in Bahrain in Gush Etzion, and we had, you know, natural springs. We jump into them at like, you know, before sunrise, and oh yeah, the heavens would open up. It was, <laughs> it was a pretty transformational experience, <laughs> to say the least. I was also interested. Um, you were talking about um, how there were efforts within Christianity to separate Jesus from his Jewishness. You especially pointed out the German Christian movement. movement. Um, they, uh, to quote you, you said, in developing Christianity that was not at odds with Nazi ideology, um, they they asserted the the German Christian theologians could invent Jesus the Aryan, who was hated and persecuted by the Jews. Mm. Meaning, if Jesus was hated and persecuted by the Jews, then it was turn around was fair play. They should hate and persecute the Jews that were in Germany at the time. Um, I think even... I'm sorry, what was that? Even more. I, I, I think, I just want to point out that, you know, listen, I mean, Nazism is not a Christian phenomenon, but the Nazis understood that if they were going to get, um, you know, buy-in from... Uh, a very Christian population of Germany, if they were gonna get proper buy-in to this ideology uh, so that people wouldn't view it as anti-Christian, then they were going to have to find a way to include Christianity and a way to show that Christianity is not at odds with Nazism, that you could be both. And this is really where the, the German Christian movement comes in as one, um, one articulation within the Protestant church in Germany is a German Christian movement. And the German Christian movement really, you know, worked actively to articulate, uh, you know, a form of Christianity that was very consonant with Nazi ideals. But one of the obvious problems is what do you do with the Jewishness of Jesus? Like that's an impossibility. There's no way those two things can work together. And so they very consciously, and there's a wonderful book uh, called The Arrogant Jesus by Susanna Heschel, um, a, a tremendous, you know, scholarly piece, very readable and very shocking. Uh, but, you know, about that whole process of the de judification the conscious uh, separation of uh, Christianity from its Jewish setting, from its Jewishness, in order to, uh, you know, make it work with uh, the anti-Jewish practices uh, of the Nazis. I think even uh, to a lesser degree, um, if you make Jesus too Jewish, then you end up with the question, a, 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 a Christian who wants to become more like Jesus would be left with the dilemma, so maybe I should become Jewish just like Jesus was. That could be a big uh, theological crisis if Jesus becomes too Jewish. So I'm not sure that it's that thought through, right? But I would say that the reality is that very soon after Jesus, um, you know, within, um, I don't know, uh, seven or eight decades, uh, the, the church is, you know, overwhelmingly Gentile, that it is no longer a Jewish movement. Uh, and that, mm -hmm. you know, that I think sort of realistically, um, you know, I understand the challenge of presenting a Jewish Jesus, uh, the fact is, is that, you know, there is, um, there, there is a tension here. This is a largely Gentile church that develops a certain amnesia about its Jewish roots over history, uh, but it needs 
Uh, it, it needs images that speak to its faithful. Uh, that's, you know, that's completely reasonable. And in fact, you know, when we look at medieval Christian art, I don't think that anybody sat down and said, oh, quick, let's de -judify Jesus. Uh, not at all. I don't think that was the intention. Uh, but that was how it functioned, okay? That by trying to sort of write theological traditions back into these original scenes, you know, by putting the, the rosary or, you know, the cross in Latin into the baptism, those kinds of things. I don't think it was, it was trying to say something about Jews at all, but it functioned to say something about Jews. And that was, you know, again, Jesus uh, is like us, not like them. Hmm. Okay, so, wow. So you were saying that the undoing of Jesus was a necessary um, function uh, or performed by the Nazis in order to separate Judaism from Christianity, from Jesus, so that they could they could carry out their Aryan uh, agenda. Certainly in the case of the Shoah and the Aryan Jesus, the de -judification of Jesus is very conscious. It's, it is, mm. it's, you know, it, and do you think it has uh, lingering effects today? This was an off the cuff the question. Whole, <laughs> right. I think the whole issue is a very complex one for Christianity because you know there's there's kind of two poles here. Uh, when you think about, you know, from a, from a Christian point of view, when you think about the incarnation, and one is a very particular, right? That is, um, this is, uh, you know, a Jewish man in uh, Judea, uh, you know, very historically particular, um, you know, in the womb of a daughter of Israel, uh, you know, so very, very historical in particular. And at the same time, there is this uh, belief that, you know, it's it's more than just this one particular thing, that um, that it's for everyone and that it gives life to everyone. Um, and so there is this sort of uh, universal pull in terms of thinking about the incarnation. Those are those are two very hard things to uh, to, to hold together is the particular part and this universal part. Um, so I think that, that that challenge runs through Christian theology um, and it probably also impacts this whole question of sort of forgetting or ignoring or muting that, um, you know, historically concrete Jewish Jesus. And I guess the challenge for Christians is how to hold both of those poles at the same at the same time. It's very interesting. Ah, I hear that. W would you say, um, yeah, the problem with a Jewish Jesus is it's it's a it's ethnic, it's a race, it's specific. So de-emphasizing the Jewish aspect of Jesus makes makes his teachings much more universal and much more relatable. Wow. That's that's a beautifully positive aspect of it. I think. <laughs> I think I think so too. Um as long as you don't, you know, I mean, I think to err on either side is probably a you know, a theological problem uh for for Christianity and and again, one that has um real historical results. Hmm. If I'm not mistaken, it was also it was a dilemma within the early followers of Jesus, whether or not to become universal or whether to remain within the Jewish people, the Jewish nation. And right. I mean, is that whole sort of question of you know, what do you what do you do with Gentiles? Why right. you know, do, do Gentiles have to become Jewish 
in order to follow Jesus, right? Do Gentiles have to perform the, the mitzvot and uh, circumcise and all that? It's a huge um, kind of crisis issue in the earliest churches. What do you do with Gentiles? Because it, that was not obvious. That's interesting. So they kind of opened up by de judif how would we say this? De, de, de judifying undoing Jesus. Um, they opened the doors. Um, and I think Judaism has gone the opposite direction. We've kept Judaism very Jewish and closed the doors and kept them closed. This is an interesting. I haven't cut out whatever I thought I'm about saying. it either, to I be want, honest. I want to think about what you're saying. That's a very, very interesting, uh, interesting perspective. I mean, it's one of the one of the um more tangible um differences between Christianity and Judaism is Christianity, you know, it's spreading the gospel. You know, I Christians seem shocked when 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 I say please don't preach the gospel to me, preach don't proselytize and they'll be like oh but this is the best thing in my life and i want to share it with you wouldn't you if you had the keys to heaven wouldn't you want to share it uh, no <laughs> i mean that's a very jewish response no we don't share it we don't feel the the um compulsion to uh to spread the gospel of judaism um, right. No, I think you're you're absolutely right. I mean, there's no there's no idea or expectation uh, in Judaism that Judaism is uh, that, that the world needs to be Jewish. It's absolutely fine and expected right. that there will be Gentiles in, in the world to, to the end. Right. Yeah. Uh, whereas Christianity, that's that's a universal vision that, you know, everybody is to come to to Christ. Which is why they, and then they necessarily had to open up the doors, make him a more uh, universal identity, um, take off his tefillin. And that's very, I, I actually, it, it, it puts, I think it's in a positive light. You know, in, that's what they do in order to be universal, in order to bring good to other people. So that's, that's yes. very sweet. Um, I think that's the good. That's the good side <laughs> of of that of that impulse. I that certainly is. agree. It's it's not it's not all bad. And let's also remember, you know, the ability to take to take um, any of these images to take to take the Bible to take the Exodus as a, um, a, a theme to fight um, to fight slavery, right? Right. right. Uh, I mean that speaks to the to the power of these of these narratives of these images to the power of a universal God that the Exodus is not just about Jews leaving Egypt, uh, you know, an oppression under Pharaoh for the Promised Land. It is also, you know, a universal image, but you can't lose track of the specific historical story. Also, you can't kind of write Jews out of our own narrative. In the same way, you know, to not lose track of the historical particular uh, Jewish Jesus, to do so is to do, is to do violence to the, to the text. Right. And, and you do lose something like, uh, um, when you read the Bible, there are actual places. Jerusalem is an actual place. These are actual historical events. And if you turn it more into an analogy that's universalized, then you're you are necessarily losing something. So yeah, and it's not just symbols. Right, right. It's um, so when I read this, you said I, I, this quote just dropped me. W whether that was through representing the Virgin Mary and the child Jesus holding a rosary, the injection of a cross and in Latin into the scene of Christ's baptism or the transformation of the Passover meal into a Christian Eucharist, complete with kneeling and distribution of communion, historical anachronisms, bang, historical anachronisms have never stood in the way of turning Jesus into a good Christian. Um, when you When I read that, you actually, we we both <laughs> connected. You sent me a video. There's a video of 
<laughs> it's supposed to be humorous where where a, a young British man um, prays to see Jesus and Jesus is a black Rastafarian uh, with red locks. And he's like, well, you're not what I expected. And I'm laughing. I'm like, there's a lot of issues there. You know, <laughs> Jesus was not prob most probably not black. He certainly didn't have dreadlocks. He was absolutely not a Rastafarian. But at the same time, he was also not um as he was also not holding a cross, um, especially not as a baby. Um, and he wasn't um he wasn't uh uh having a, a Christian Eucharist. He was having a, a Lael Seder, he was having a Passover Seder. Um, which is why, like, I remember reading about the Last Supper in the, in, in the New Testament. It's Lael Seder. It reminded me of what I do every year with my family. Um, so Jesus was very clearly, so there was this intentional, blatant, um, um, anarchy, uh, um, anachronistic uh, presentation of Jesus within within Christianity, which which was a non-Jewish Jesus, which and and again, I don't think that you know um, medieval Renaissance artists sat down and said, "Wow, let's let's write the Jews, let's write the Jewish context out of this artwork." Not at all. They were, you know, writing profound theological truths, the sort of eternal church into their into their art, um, and. And they wanted it to be recognizable to their audience. And, you know, mm. I, I don't think that that was the, the impulse. I don't think that they thought at all about the Jews. But I do think that if you imagine a, a you know, a medieval culture that was not as visually saturated as ours is today, where you get to see one, um, you know, one constructed piece of artwork ever in your life when you go to church you see that when you see that okay it um colonizes your imagination and when you think about first of all you don't have access remember to the biblical text because people couldn't read then it wasn't in the vernacular um you don't have access to the text and you see jesus doing things that you and you know the other people in the pews uh, do all the time, and so Jesus becomes just like you, and has absolutely no connection again to those sort of wretched Jews down the street. Why would you even think such a thing? And also, so I think that it also again, to be honest, I think, I think I think Jews can be on some level unrelatable because we are so different. So by creating an uh, an unJewish Jesus, they they can they can more closely personally relate to Jesus. I think. Sure. I think there's that. You also in your article you you touched on uh, you 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 raised an issue which I think people don't quite realize. I think I actually take this more seriously than than my Christian friends. You wrote the proliferation pro proliferation of Palestinian Jesus images and claims following October 7th. Um, I've written about that quite a bit. Um, people don't understand. It's really, it was, it was actually um, a, an agenda thought up by a, um, I think it was, I think it was uh, Sarit Nueva or um, she was the, she was a Christian in the Palestinian authority in the Fatah um, establishment. Um, she's still around. Um, and Arafat loved it. And he jumped all over it. And it crops up every once in a while. Um, there was even um, a senator, or what was his name, a black man who was a pastor. Um, and he even came down with this. And he was, he was, he was, he was a pastor. Um, it's, it, it crops up quite a bit. Even uh, especially, I think, the members of the squad tweeted out about this, about Jesus being a Palestinian. Uh, the Palestinian president even even referred to Jesus as a Shahid, as the first Palestinian martyr. 
meaning he was a terrorist, which uh, which is about as un-Jesus as you can get. Um, it's, it's a really huge issue that 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 hasn't gone away. Um, I understand how I see it as a Jew. It just it's it's on its face value. It's a it, it it's not so much an attack on Jesus. It's an attack on the Jewish connection to the land. Um, could you unpack that for me? Like, how, how do Christians uh, uh, relate to that statement that Jesus was a Palestinian? How do I? For me, it would be horrifying. You know, if that's your, if that's the Son of God, now they're changing his identity. Well, I think first of all, this is um, it's very powerful for for many Christians as as a, as an image so you know uh christmas this this past christmas so following october 7th um and and into the gaza war what we saw is um you know really very very popular and shared all over social media um an image that had been put together at the church of the nativity in bethlehem uh so the you know standard kind of nativity scene of the uh, you know, Holy Family and baby Jesus in the in the manger. And so um, what they had done is they had put baby Jesus um, and uh, surrounded him with with rubble um, and wrapped him in a in a kafia. Uh And sort of, um, you know, so this was Jesus as, a, you know, Palestinian baby. Uh, who you know would have been uh, suffering and under under threat from Israel, um, and I think that the biggest problem here is not about you know really was Jesus Palestinian was he Jewish what kind of terminology we use I mean there's real problems here but I don't think that's the biggest issue I think the biggest issue is that when Jesus becomes a Palestinian then who is under threat from Israel, then Israel becomes like the Romans. And it is the Romans who crucified Jesus. And so then we start to sort of feed back into that very ancient and very sinister uh, anti, anti-Jewish trope that the Jews are responsible for the crucifixion, that the Jews are um, a threat to Christians. They're a threat to Christianity. They're they're dangerous, and they are on the side of um, of of evil. They are against things that are good and true and holy. They're on the side of the of the demonic and the dangerous. Uh, so I think that that's really the biggest problem here is how that just you know, reinforces some of the most heinous anti-Semitic, anti-Jewish, uh, you know, stereotypes that that have existed. Mm. So for me as a Jew to hear someone say Jesus was a Palestinian, I'm like, no, Jesus was a Jew. And by saying he's a Palestinian, you're saying that Bethlehem, I used to live right down the street from Bethlehem in Gush Etzion, um, that you're saying that Bethlehem is a Palestinian town and Palestinian territory, and the whole place was Palestinian. And so I'm a usurper. But what you're saying, which is interesting, is that from the Christian perspective, <clears throat> to say that Jesus was a Palestinian turns the Jews into an oppressor, which is very much the woke agenda, is they're correct, they're they're holy and righteous because they're oppressed. Um, so the, by saying Jesus is a Palestinian, the Israelis necessarily become the oppressors. It doesn't even matter if it's our land originally. That's not the point. The point is that we are the oppressors of the Palestinians just as we were eh, the oppressors of Jesus. And that's a scary, that is a scary road to go down. We know where that leads. We've seen that <laughs> all throughout history. That's uh, really, yeah. Wow, wow. Um, so 
um i just i just wanted to to, to ask um i before we before we leave you've been you've been very gracious with your time and really i i just you you wrote this article i highly recommend reading it i highly recommend following uh dr shapiro she's really my gosh um uh you you also wrote um, when you said and you, you you referred to this that that Jesus had would have a lot more in common with your twenty three year old Jewish son living in the Galilee, um, so would you say that by reinforcing the Jewish identity of Jesus that it gives us more of a future to connect with Christians be, between Christians and Jews? Is that oh, the most certainly, most That's... certainly, absolutely. I mean, besides for sort of historical accuracy, okay. um, I, I think that, um, you know, really coming to a deep understanding of Jesus's Jewishness uh, is, is essential and is an essential piece for, for better Jewish Christian relations. And what it means is, I mean, the Christians that I know who understand Jesus's Jewishness say to me, like, wait a second, you're going to have like Passover. You're going to kind of eat the Paschal sacrifice, um, you know, in your, in your living room, you're going to eat unleavened bread like Jesus did. Can, can I come over? Like, can I have some, uh, you know, that, that, uh, that understand that there's something about contemporary Jews. And, you know, we have to be careful about anachronisms here too, but there's something yeah. about contemporary Jews and about our practice that can tell them um, about uh, about the basis of, of their own faith um, and about what Jesus would have, would have done. And I think that that means that, Suddenly, you know, Jews and Christians can start to meet. I don't want to talk about whether the playing field is even or not, but can can meet in in deeper ways where it's not just about you know kind of being a good citizen or um, you know solidarity, Judeo-Christian really, values. That's right, <laughs> which are all you know from good things, but uh, but where you know. Christians who are in touch with their with the Jewish roots of their faith um, can find their own faith revitalized, and the fact that that is through engagement and friendship and participation yeah. with Jews today, I think that's something very profound uh, in terms of the quality of our and the depth of our relationship together. Yeah, I say it's it's as soon as the my my Christian friends come up to me and say, oh, Jesus was Jewish and that's an important thing to them. I find suddenly I have something really significant to offer them. And it's the thing that makes me so uncomfortable. <laughs> it's the thing that until now is the big separator. <laughs> but it's... Right. And plus, it's a little bit weird for us, right? Because it's very we've, weird. Kind of, uh, we've <laughs> sort of internalized a certain um, discomfort, right? Like, why would anybody want to want to eat our unleavened bread, right? I mean, much is kind <laughs> of embarrassing, right? Yeah. You know, everybody Especially else, Christians. Christians. <laughs> right. And so it's, uh, you know, it, it's also, I think, potentially a real, a real healing for us as Jews, uh, to 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 not feel so uncomfortable or say like why why would you be interested in this sort of weird minority particular you know religion that we that we do uh, to 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 help to sort of for us to to get a sense also uh, you know to to really uh, be in touch with its its value its yeah. value its importance that it's not just about us. That actually, it touches the whole world uh, through through Christianity. I, I have a dear friend. Um, he's he's German. He's Christian. Uh, lives in Porla Porayli. His name is Alex Dietz. He's amazing. And you know him? You. 
<laughs> oh gosh, he's like, I I love him because every time I'm around him, I'm a nicer person. So <laughs> that's why I treasure him. But he refers to the Bible as the Bible we have in common. <laughs> it's it's which is the the what we would call the Old Testament, the, the Tanakh. Um, because the New Testament we don't necessarily have in common, but we have so much to offer in, in those areas where we do intersect. You know, Jesus being one of them. Oh, you want to understand about the Last Supper? Well, you know, let me tell you about, you know, four questions. Let me tell you about what my kids and I do on, on Passover. Let me tell you what it means for us. Um, that's what Jesus was going through. Um, there's, there's a, there, there is a lot of, a lot we have to offer. And it's Dafka, the thing that's so difficult for us. <laughs> That's that's what blows me away. Wow. Fascinating. So, Dr. Shapiro, um, unless there's something else you'd care to share with us um, this time around, I'm going to be following you closely. And if you write anything else as compelling as this last article, you'll be getting a call from me. Um, it's just it's it was really that amazing. Um, well, enjoyed our conversation. Thank you. I'm so glad. I'm so glad. So now I have a new friend. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, and um, all, let all of you be blessed because if you bless us, we got no choice. That's what we got to do. <laughs> okay. Thanks so much. Be blessed.